Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome to the flight deck of the USS Intrepid here at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. My name is Zach Murray, and I work here on the fundraising team with a focus on former crew member relations. Today, we are here in our final installment of the Aircraft of the Month series, focused on the Douglas F-4D Skyray, beautifully displayed here behind me. Now, in today's session, we are going to be discussing with our aircraft team what the restoration will look like for this Skyray. What is in the plan? plans looking now that it is finally on the deck and what will we need from you from support to be able to make this project possible now as we will discuss today there are a lot of needs for this aircraft and if you would like to make a gift port of our restoration of the skyray visit www.intrepidmuseum.org slash support skyray any gift any size will allow us to be able to preserve this cold war marvel for generations to be able to see and learn from for, for future years to come. Now, to my left, I have Eric Bame back again, joining us to talk about the project. On my further left, we've got Peter Taraka, manager of aircraft restoration here at the museum. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, great to be here. It's fantastic. So happy to be joined by you guys today. Now, as you guys can see, Sky Ray safely on board the ship, Eric, Let's talk about what the craning was like last, like last week and how you were feeling. You know, uh, they say uh, make a plan and work your plan, and it worked out great. Uh, shout outs to Matt Woods from our operations uh, department. He worked with uh, Bay Crane, and everything went just perfectly. And they had all these contingencies. They thought of everything that could go wrong, but in the end, nothing went wrong. Everything worked like a clock from the ground move in the middle of the night on a Sunday morning uh, to the craning onto the barge, the barge move, the arrival in Manhattan and coming up here to the elevator. Everything was perfect. Uh, it, it just couldn't make a better plan than that. It was absolutely excellent. That's what we like to hear. For those of you that joined us last week, I was actually down on the pier going live and uh, it was amazing to see. And like you say, uh, it, couldn't have gone any better from my perspective, and I'm glad to hear from your perspective as well. Things went so well. Yeah, I moved a few airplanes since I've been here, and uh, that was absolutely the most trouble-free move we've ever done. So, And with an airplane, that doesn't come apart. So we were ready for anything, but it all worked out. Now, Eric, as we've talked about, you know, your work was kind of done once you were able to find it. Matt helping us with the move. I'm going to turn us over to Peter here and talk a little bit about the restoration. What have you seen now that it is safely up on the deck? Peter, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, this airplane is already in it's, in it's in great shape, considering that it's been sitting outside at a museum in Connecticut for at least three, possibly four decades. Uh, it's in fantastic shape. The, it's the, I'm not certain if it's the original paint, but other than being badly oxidized, uh, there are no bare areas of aluminum skin. It's, it's in pretty good shape. And just like any of our other projects, the first step is a thorough cleaning. Uh, I can see just looking in little cracks, uh, bird nesting material and things like this. Uh, so, Yes, the first step once it gets into the workshop is is uh, doing all of that, doing what is the dirty work. And, uh, and <laughs> the airplane will become clean, but the hangar will become filthy. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the step after the cleaning is clean up the hangar because, uh, well, then we get on to sanding and inspection of areas where... Uh, there may be uh, uh, damage, uh, digging into removing panels and getting more uh, invasive about the, the um, inspection. But the jet engine has been removed. It will be easier for us to get at any of the corrosion issues that are going on inside the airplane. Uh, let's see, other than that, it's just making a list of the uh, more substantial uh, issues that need to be addressed. I have a couple of, I had to, you can't see it from here, to do some modification on the top side of the airplane in order for the crane to, to be able to pick the airplane up. And those two areas need to be repaired. Uh, there are a couple of features on the airplane that aren't present that we would like to add. 
Uh, yeah, and so what that brings me to is, uh, yeah, we need to make these things happen, and that's where we rely on Zach for the, for, for the fundraising aspect of it. Thank you, Peter. That was a really great run through of what we're looking at with Skyray. You know, I, I look at the aircraft here behind me, you know, painting. We're going to talk about a little bit here in a moment. But as you say, things are looking pretty good. And again, it's so nice to hear from the experts that things are looking good and you're feeling confident with your plan as well. Now, you mentioned going into the hangar. I'm pretty thrilled today that we get to be outside. It's a really nice day. Don't even have to wear my sunglasses with the overcast day. Nice to be out on the aircraft elevator, Skyray stand behind us. Now, I understand, of course, that the plan will be to get it into the hangar and begin the restoration inside, but I also know that right now we have the Cougar over inside the restoration hangar. <clears throat> Could you tell us a little bit about what is happening inside the hangar right now and what the plan is looking like for that Cougar, that aircraft that you're currently working on, once that's done, of course, Skyray becoming your next project? Certainly, Zach. Um, the Cougar is nearly complete. I'm thinking by the end of August, uh, it will be ready to return to flight line display. We're just putting on the, the finishing touches. Just today, I received from our graphics uh, people uh, all of the stencils that we need for the final markings that are going on. And uh, yeah, so my target is the end of August for the Cougar. And then this will come in. And um, uh, to be honest, I'm somewhat chomping at the bit. Uh, every day, every day when I leave work, I walk by this and I'm like, oh, hurry, gotta hurry, gotta hurry, gotta hurry. Uh, now, the bulk of the work will be taking place through the winter months. Uh, and uh, actually, that's, that's good because during the winter months or during the off season, I'm permitted to focus on whatever's in the hangar uh, uh, as opposed to maintaining the collection outdoors during the high season. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to doing that this winter. Beautiful. Yeah, that's going to be very exciting as our visitors come back next year to be able to see Freshly Cougar and of course later this year, but then of course Skyray once your team is complete and feeling extra confident, beautiful and ready to go on flight line display. One question that just came to my mind as we were just learning a little bit about moving the aircraft around, I saw the craning was a huge project, moving it down from Connecticut, barges. I mean, almost every mode of transport, I guess, outside of literally flying it here was involved in getting the aircraft here to the museum. Peter, could you just mention briefly on how you move aircraft around on the deck here today? I wonder if our visitors understand what that process might look like. And if I'm if I'm overstepping, you could just give me a little understanding that, well, Zach, we get it to where it needs to go, I guess is how I'll say it. <laughs> well, before I get into that, let me just let me just backtrack for one to say that I uh, uh, just want to add my touch to the, the whole craning operation. Uh, I was elected to ride the barge with the airplane up here on last Tuesday morning. And it was just a it was just a beautiful day and uh, bringing Sky Ray too intrepid i felt like i was on the bow and waving like hey <laughs> yeah this is my plane no 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 i, I uh, actually had you down fashion day that day you did not get paid that <laughs> well that was it was still worth it it was still worth it uh but anyway what i the one thing i wanted to say was that after this is after this is all done and after we've uh uh turtled all these obstacles uh when this airplane goes goes out on display next year, uh, I'm uh, I may be a little biased, but I think itself it's going to generate a substantial fan base. That's that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Excellent. I'm going to be the number one supporter of the uh, Skyray fan base club, I think, in that regard. Did you notice he skirted the whole question on how to move airplanes up here? I mean, I did, but. We'll move right past it. Yeah, but this is what's not here, folks. This is what, sometimes it's just brute force and ignorance to move an airplane because we don't we don't have a tow vehicle up here, and uh, sometimes we move them by hand. Some of the bigger airplanes we got to get the little gator that's down on the uh, on the pier, 
moved up here and we can pull them. But even that machine is pretty wimpy. Yeah, yeah it, it is. is. There's nothing better than muscle. We get all the employees yeah. up here who have good backs. We have, but yeah, yeah, we make it. We make a, a party of it. Yeah, I was going to say I'll start doing my push-ups so I can be ready for the sky ray move. And you know, perhaps the support of our viewers here could uh, help us to be able to get some tow yeah, materials yeah. out on the deck. Hey, yeah, we, we, these we, we know that our viewers they come through for us when it comes to restoring yeah. aircraft, helping our helping our team here to be able to present these like, these aircraft for as we've mentioned before generations to be able to come so we'll we'll, we'll tackle that one on our hey, next anybody's edition he's got an old uh, aircraft tug from an airport where uh, we're, we're always we could talk and let we me just add deal. if that were to happen it would be emblazoned <laughs> with the john q public uh marking exactly yeah. exactly now peter walked us through a little bit of the restoration process and we might go diving back into that i want to know a little bit more of that list of needs what does skyray really you know what 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 do we need to get our hands on here that maybe we don't have but before we do that i did want to speak with eric again briefly on what the sort of final paint job may be looking like because if to peter's point we're going to have a fan club here you know what should people be looking for and what is our sort of final design going to be because i'm remiss that i haven't mentioned this so far of course for maybe our new viewers Believe it or not, this sky ray here behind us actually flew off of Intrepid in the early 1960s. So, Eric, talk to us. What is sky ray's final sort of decal? Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word here. I'm thinking uh, uh, you can help us. Yeah, you can help us. Well, uh, believe it or not, it is uh, right now emblazoned with VF-162 and the markings uh, of the air group with the AH on the tail is the proper air group. It's kind of close. It's kind of close. Some things that uh, have to be changed is uh, you'll see it's got a, kind of emblazoned on the rudder and on the ailerons with blue spangled with yellow stars. That's actually incorrect color. Uh, the color is actually black with the yellow goldish stars. Um, and also we have to figure out what the Modex number was, and that's the three-digit number that it wore on the nose while on the deck. Now, I've gone through all our historical photographs, and I'm kind of narrowing it down. Uh, I have the photograph of this airplane, but it's a close-up. It's a close-up of right there in the cockpit area where you could see the bureau number quite plainly. And that, that's what started this whole process. But uh, I can't find a picture of this airplane showing the nose. So I don't know what the Modex number was. Um, so I'm narrowing it down. I'm down to two candidates. Uh, one of them, there's an obscured last digit number six, which it may very well be this airplane. And, and uh, I think it'll probably wear uh, Modex number 113. But uh, as you see it, it's pretty close to the markings it's going to have. Excellent. So it'll just be, you know, after I would imagine sanding involved and maybe Peter, rather than me imagining, I'll kick it over to you right now. What does that painting process sort of going to look like? You know, do you have to be sanding the current existing off? I do see a little bit of scratching, some fading, things like that. What painting process sort of look like to be able to get it ready? Um, well, it is a very much uh, an individual case by case uh, uh approach uh in and when i say case by case i mean square foot by square foot uh of the airplane uh this airplane it looks like the most of the upper surfaces are just all it is 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 bad oxidation and it looks like the original primers or the original base coat uh that was applied at the factory is still it's still pretty sound uh so, so yes, uh, I can't really make any blindness. That would be kind of speculative, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you abreast. Yeah. That's what we like to hear. I know I said today is going to be our final installment for this particular series about Skyray coming here, but we'll be sure to keep you guys in, informed over the course of the off season as Skyray is actually inside the hangar on how the work is going. So. Peter will, uh, of course, be back talking with you guys again sometime very, very soon. Now, Eric, we've mentioned a little bit about adding the aircraft to our collection, how beautiful it's going to look out here in the flight line. Could you just talk to us a little bit briefly? And I know we have covered before. How will Skyray being added to the collection, especially as an aircraft that flew off of the ship, help us to be able to continue to tell Intrepid's story, help us to contextualize the history of the ship and its crew? You know, I work, as I mentioned earlier, I work with the former crew member community. They are so excited to be able to have, a, you know, almost, almost a crew member in a sense, or and being added again. So, you know, how, how does Skyray sort of fit into the history here? And, and what are we most excited about being able to share? I was excited to get Skyray because it's filling a little bit of a niche. You know, we tell the World War II story where Intrepid served 
pretty good. And we tell the Vietnam War story pretty good. And, you know, those are the two hot wars and they seem to get the most attention. You got that in between time. We did uh, recover some space missions and they get some great story time. Uh, but that Cold War, you know, these guys that flew this airplane did not fly in battle, mm. but they were ready for it. And, and that's what it's all about. I really want to find these guys, not just the pilots, but maybe the mechanics or the guys who loaded up the guns or loaded up the, the bombs or the missiles on it. You know, I, I want to talk to these guys because they were getting ready for something bad. Of course, Sky Rays were all retired by the time the Vietnam War heated up. But a lot of those pilots traded in these. If they stayed in the Navy, they probably flew something else and probably had time over Vietnam. So these guys got to find them. Come tell me your stories. We've got a great oral history program here, and I'd love to add their voices to that uh, because those oral histories actually get used right into our exhibits. Uh, a lot of our exhibits, the footage from the oral history is actually used in the exhibit. Um, it's some of that, some of those uh, oral histories we turned into artwork too. too. Mm. Uh, quite amazing. So, uh, really important program we have here, and I just got to find the guys with this airplane. When you go back in the early 1960s, those guys are hard to find. Mm -hmm. Yep. Totally makes sense. You know, as we say, it's sort of a filling that niche of transitioning from World War II into uh, Intrepid's later service in Vietnam. I know for those that uh, always watch these programs, I've said this before, but one of my favorite parts about working here at the Intrepid and being part of this history is that, you know, from 1943 to 1974, Intrepid is really spanning a lot of technological advancement as we think about aircraft, as we think about shipbuilding happening in World War II, even radar systems. That island behind us here today you know we can really be able to see us almost step-by-step -step process on the evolution of this technology as we're here on the decks and experiencing and viewing these planes so i'm just thrilled to know that sky ray is able to kind of fit in there and and understand that step do you said the crew members the pilots you know they're they're transitioning out of sky ray they might be moving into another type of aircraft a sky uh, a sky raider perhaps even sky hawk here so you know helping again to and understand, sort of fill in that timeline as we go. Yeah, you mentioned Sky Raider and Skyhawk and Sky Ray. Uh, you got a little bit of a thing going on there, but they're all from the Douglas Aircraft Company. And uh, really, the brilliance of one designer involved with all three of those airplanes, Ed Heineman. And I always had in the back of my mind an Ed Heineman exhibit, you know, but because he was so influential on aircraft throughout the, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. It's just, uh, you know, you know, with the Navy, too. So it's a, it's going to tie in. i uh, got to see how that will develop. But now we have a third example of one of his designs here. Uh, there's, a, there's so many stories to tell. It gets deep and deep. Filling out the bench. We love to have a deep bench here, and it definitely does get deep. Now, I, I forgot to mention earlier, and I'm sure everyone has realized by now, we are, of course, live today. I've got my set of questions to cover on this incredible aircraft. If you guys have any questions, please do put them into the chat. Bring them on to us because I'm getting to the end of mine, and uh, I'm going to need a couple of yours to uh, be able to get us there. So as we get ready to wrap up today, I, I want to just speak to these two, and uh, we'll start with Peter, and then we'll talk to Eric. And Eric, you may have mentioned it a little bit before. Uh, Okay, we've got a question. Let's hear it. Uh, what is the first step in Skyray's restoration? All right, Peter, what's the first step in Skyray's restoration? Uh, step one, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, I'm not sure, uh, is a thorough cleaning. Uh, prior to uh, the assessment, which is step two, just uh, looking at the work, uh, anything that's... Uh, not right, uh, we have to clean everything. Uh, there's a lot of mildew, there's uh, a lot of bird nesting material, there are pine needles, there's hopefully no bees nests. Uh, Those are always fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's step one. And removing not just the natural uh, flotsam that's in there, but also like hydraulic fluid stains, anything that you know, that was part of the airplane at one time. Uh, yeah. Can I add something? Uh, sure. One of the things that a lot of airplanes of this age have, especially in the instrumentation, are things that make the instruments glow. And those things are radioactive. And so before we even started the process of thinking about bringing this here, we had the Navy uh, recommend that an inspector take a look at it while it was still in Connecticut. It did a thorough inspection and there's no radioactive material on this. So we've actually had all the airplanes here at Intrepid check for that and everything is clean here. 
that's part of the cleanup. The cleanup includes things like that. From bees' nests to radioactive material. I mean, you could be finding. Now, I, I, I'm imagining again, and we've got our experts here, glowing just for night flights or just to be able to see it? Or Of course, yeah, yeah, your lights go out and uh, the instruments will glow. So, But uh, that material that's on their back, decades ago, it wasn't as safe as the things they're using today. And uh, you just, just don't want that around. If an instrument should leak or break or some of that stuff fall out, it's not going to be, it's, it's, it's not so dangerous that you're going to grow a third eyeball tomorrow, but you just don't want that kind of contamination on our planet. So take care properly. It, it really just, again, speaks to the, the expert understanding that these two gentlemen have here next to me and also that attention to detail of what you need to be monitoring, looking for, cleaning, assessing. Uh, I, I, we could stand here all day almost and just be able to explore every pot, to bees nest, all the different elements in between. Now, my final question for you guys, just as before we get ready to go, and I'll, we'll see if we have any more audience questions just before I sign us off. Uh, what are the final needs? What do we need here to add? You know, I, I've heard from both of you guys that the aircraft is in good shape. Of course, there's some work to get it flight line official and be ready to go. But Peter, from your perspective, whether it's a machine to assist in the work that you're going to be doing, maybe Skyray could be missing something. To my eye, it looks pretty intact, but maybe there's something that's not there. So we'll start with Peter and then I'll kick it to Eric as well. But what sort of needs are we looking for? We're, we're asking our viewers in, for support here for this project. What's outstanding? Thank you, Zach. Um, oh, there are a bunch of things. Uh, the, the Skyray has its own needs, but before I, I go to that, I want to mention that the workshop has has uh, costly needs also. Uh, we require uh, PPE whenever volunteers, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed here for volunteers. When volunteers show up, I need to get them all equipped properly before we work on the aircraft. Uh, uh, yeah, so there there are s several needs to keep the workshop oper operating properly. Oh, yeah, we desperately need a, a mobile air compressor. Uh, yeah, and uh, as far as as far as Skyray itself goes, if we want to, we have dreams of what we want this thing to look like next year. And uh, all the pictures... I have seen of Skyrays on Intrepid. It is equipped with uh, drop tanks, auxiliary fuel tanks that uh, a pilot needs for the mission. He uses the fuel in those before he gets to a point where he needs to conduct air-to-air -air combat and then releases the tanks, so why they're called drop tanks. Uh, I have a uh, manufacturer in the, in the Midwest who will make these for me but uh, he hasn't given me a number yet. Uh, and I'm assuming since it's custom work, uh, it's probably going to be close to 10 grand. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, unless, uh, somebody out there owns an Aero 300 gallon tank. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they went out into surplus, believe it or not. And I've seen some at Army Navy stores uh, holding up the sign, you know, outside, but they're out there. So if anybody knows where there's an Aero 300 gallon fuel tank, that, so. that would be even better to not, to not have, I mean, this guy does wonderful work with, he can make a replica anything. And the best part is it usually weighs about 10% of what the real thing weighs, but, but to the genuine uh, drop tanks would be, would be awesome. Explain the drop tank as, as an employee. Oh yes. Okay. Now this this is this is a super cool part about uh, Intrepid and its connection with Skyray. Uh, Skyray had a somewhat uh, limited endurance time. Its fuel capacity, even with the drop tanks, uh, provided it with I don't know the exact figure. Let's say X minutes of flying time before the pilot needed to return to the ship. So airplanes after. Uh, uh, newer than Skyray were usually equipped with in-flight refueling capability, uh, but Skyray didn't have that. And I think, I'm not, I don't know, maybe you know, it was intrepid mechanics that figured out 
that they could simply mount a refueling probe on the front of one of these drop tanks, and it would give uh, Skyray unlimited endurance. Uh, uh, so that's a that's a very special thing. So to have our Skyray uh, displaying that would be not only would I love it and Eric love it, but but we would have tour guides that could tell this story and make it. I don't know, make, increase the value of having Skyray. Already purchased the nozzle, the nozzle, which is kind of the business yes. end of the inflate yeah. where the bucket comes down from the tanker and it plugs in. Yeah. I found one on eBay right before the pandemic started. I said, let's buy that. And, and maybe uh, that will be, that'll get yeah, the ball rolling. Ball yeah, yeah. Thank you. I I hope that uh, the drop tanks are in our very near future because the little the 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 anecdote regarding the ability to do the inner the inner refueling the in-flight refueling. I mean, as you say, what 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 better way to be able to continue to tell an intrepid story and then also sky rays here as well. Um, it sounded to me, Eric, and I'm not going to speak for you, but it was that that number that might be your biggest need to be able to find. I'm just so impressed that the work never stops. You're all, it's always back into the. I imagine you with a candle, the archives, trying to be able to find this information. What is your biggest need? Well, you can ask my wife. Even before we turn the lights out at night, I'm in bed with the, some kind of naval history book or aircraft history book every night. And there's a big pile next to my bed. So I'm always researching and looking and stuff. But really, to me, the airplanes are beautiful. I love airplanes. They're beautiful things. They're wonderful artifacts. They're, you know, people come to see them. But what uh, uh, was most to me is that like, using it as a tool to tell the story. And the story is the guys. So I got to find the guys. So the big, the big mission for me is find the guys. Find the guys that know something about this airplane. Tell me something that I can't read in the book that you experienced in person. That would be the best stories for me. What, what makes that even more difficult, uh, I think, for the Sky Ray is that there were less than 800 Sky Rays produced mm. uh, versus, take, take the Sky Raider, over 3,000 of those made. So you have a, a narrower or a, a smaller pond to fish from. Yeah. Right, a limited, co limited qu uh, co uh, a quantity of aircraft. Therefore, only logic would say fewer pilots. Uh, how many were there? Multiple squadrons? You, you just had me thinking of, you know, how there was, there was two squadrons at the same time on board Intrepid, uh, two squadrons of them. So, um, one sixty-two and four. So, I know these guys are out there. I know you're out there. You just got. <laughs> We just got to find them. They're watching today, uh, uh, hopefully through some of my work. I'll go scour the database for us. I know I've looked through a couple times in the past, but uh, we'll find these guys. We'll get our drop tanks, and we'll uh, we'll have Sky Ray looking he's great. He's, he's out there. He's leaning against the fuel tank, too. Yeah, yeah I think he's got a question. He knows. Oh, I'm going to get a word from the producer. We've got a uh, we've got a question here. Yes? Uh, what was your favorite part of the Sky Ray's journey to the Great. I think we'll kick this one to both just uh, before we wrap here today. What was your favorite part? of Sky Ray's journey here to Intrepid. Peter may have already told us, but uh, we'll start with Peter and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. We'll take us, uh, have Eric take us home. Favorite part. Okay, Liam Liam already showed me some, some outtakes of videos that he's producing uh, for Sky Ray. And I have to say the night stuff looked pretty cool. He showed me some GoPro stuff and all that. But uh, to be honest, and I'm, I don't want to hurt any feelings here, but I think the barge ride. I hold the Trump card here. The barge ride was just, the weather was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Barge ride. I, I, I you do. You, you can't miss with that. Eric, favorite, favorite part of it? Just how about when it safely landed? I hope I didn't take your line. <laughs> well, uh, I passed on the barge ride. You're welcome. Um, anyway, we could have both done that, actually. But um, I get it seasick. Um, really, the most memorable part is when those tires touched the deck right here. And I was down on the pier with some of our visitors were here and we had some donors here. We had a little event going on. We had some of our donors and I don't know who it was and you may be watching. Uh, but as the, the thing was lowered, I said, well, she's home because this airplane really flew from the ship and has not seen the deck of the ship since 1961. And now it's back. And I said, well, well she's home. And he went, whoa. And when he went, whoa, I really, wow, that is cool. And I got goosebumps from his reaction. And so my favorite part is when those tires touch this deck again after all those years. I'm just having a little bit of a whoa moment just thinking about it right here <laughs> myself. And I hope all of you are at home as well. Now, before we sign off, I just say that we're here. 
talking about Sky Ray, talking about how much of an incredible addition it's going to be to our collection, but also the work that's required to get us there. If you are able to make a gift in support of this work, in support of the restoration of Sky Ray, please do. Visit www.intrepidmuseum.org slash support Sky Ray, that's S-K-Y-R-A-Y, and make a gift to be able to help us to get those drop tanks, to be able to have the teams here, to be able to have Sky Ray looking great. We want to stay on schedule. We want to have this aircraft looking beautiful, and we want to be ready to have you be the first members of the Sky Ray fan club that Peter so predicts we'll be having here very soon. That's it for today. You'll be seeing us again you soon. Plug our model building. Uh, oh, of course oh, right. I have yeah. to plug the model building. Yes. Goodness, I'm these guys are ready for to be able to. <laughs> oh my gosh. If, okay, I should say, <laughs> you've caught me out. You've, you've caught me out. Donors of $1,000 or more will be able to take part and an incredible opportunity with these gentlemen right here. I'm going to hand the mic off to Peter because he has been doing some incredible work <laughs> with these models being designed. But if you make a gift, as I say, donors of $1,000 or more will be able to take part in a model building sort of class, course, what have you, with of the Sky Ray right here behind me. Peter, tell us a little bit of that work before we sign off. Sure, Zach. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, over the, well, let's see, when did I, it was about a year ago that I first learned that uh, the possibility of a Skyway was coming here. And, uh, well, I got a little excited. So uh, I started, both Eric and I are, are, are modelers from, from uh, way, way back. Anyway. Did you say nerds? I, <laughs> uh, so I started collecting there's a, a model, there's a manufacturer of model airplanes that started out in the 50s, maybe, and they made it, they made a model of the Sky Ray. And by today's standards, you know, it's, it's somewhat crude. It doesn't have all the intricate details that you'd find in, in models that are produced nowadays, but uh, it produces a wonderful model of the Sky Ray. Just, just a perfect, it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, without all the crazy little details that the model is, that the nerds love. Uh, anyway, I have accrued by now 15 of these model kits. And we are planning to, uh, I'm sort of working with the, the special events department. Uh, we are developing this cool little intrepid centric package where the model airplane photos of Sky Rays on Intrepid, and of course, a wonderful thank you note uh, by Alice. She's the best. Uh, uh, come with this. Come with this. Uh, this gift. Uh, and once people are uh, uh, have these gifts, Eric and I, or one of us, we haven't we haven't flipped the coin yet. Uh, we'll be producing. <laughs> what? <laughs> we'll be producing a YouTube. Uh, which sort of a tutorial that walks you through the assembly of this thing. So even if you haven't built a model, this is a this doesn't have hundreds of parts. It has maybe forty parts. It's very easy to assemble, and and we'll walk you through it anyway. And we might even give you a one eight hundred number if you have problems. There'll be tech service, and there'll be a, an adult component to that where I'll buy be doing it you know they have those things where you go to paint and drink yeah, wine yeah, yeah. Sipping paint. yeah i might i might just be sipping wine while building mine we'll see what we get so. right. well i mean with that sort of thank you to our donors i mean what a what a fantastic thank you for your work today thank you for taking the time to chat with me a little bit i hope everyone at home enjoyed and uh thank you guys for tuning in and, and being part of this work uh until next time zach eric Pe peter peter signing off